everybody. We'll, we'll go ahead and get 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 started here. Uh, you know, it's my my privilege at, to introduce uh, Julie Flygar, uh, who serves as president and CEO of Project Sleep. Uh, Julie is well known uh, uh, internationally uh, and is a patient perspective leader and a very accomplished advocate. And she's the award-winning author of Wide Awake and Dreaming, a memoir of narcolepsy. Um, for the fellows that are on the call, I, I, by the way, I highly recommend uh, uh, getting a copy of the book and, and, and reading it. It really is a great, uh, you know, uh, gives you good insights in terms of what a person with narcolepsy lives with. Um, on March 22nd of 2022, she delivered the TEDx talk, What Can You Learn from a Professional Dreamer? Since she received a diagnosis of narcolepsy with cataplexy in 2007, Ms. Flaggers advanced her leadership in sleep in the healthcare space through speaking engagements, publications, earned media collaborations, and advocacy and awareness initiatives. Prior to accepting her current role as president and CEO of Project Sleep, she served as president of Project Sleep's board, board of directors, while also gaining invaluable experience in marketing and philanthropy at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and City of Hope. Additionally, she served on the NIH Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board from 2012 to 2015. Ms. Flagger received her BA from Brown University in 2005 and her JD from Boston College Law School in 2009, focusing on health, law, policy, rare disease, drug development. And she's here today to talk to us about advocacy and sleep. So Julie, welcome, and uh, we're excited to hear you talk. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I live in Los Angeles, so it is a little early here. Um, <laughs> but I'm just really honored to be with you guys today. Um, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen, my presentation up. Um, I show. Yeah, so I'm gonna share a little bit about my personal story first. Um, I grew up, I had a very normal average childhood in New Hampshire. Uh, there's me uh, on the left as New Hampshire state champion for tennis. I've always been a big tennis player since I was little. Um, I think there are probably more cows than people in New Hampshire. So I'm not saying that I'm the best tennis player in the world, but um, I was really proud to be New Hampshire state champ when I was little. Um, and I just worked really hard through middle school and high school to try to um, get into the college of my dreams, which was Brown. Education was really important to my parents. So um, I was you know, really proud to um, go to Brown and um, study art history. Um, when I was an art history major though, I often started to go to the bathroom during class uh, to wake myself up um, and just had this feeling that um, often in class that I didn't want to go to the bathroom too early in class to wake myself up because um, I might get tired again. And you you can't be the girl who's going to the bathroom multiple times in class. It starts to look really weird. So um, in college, I just thought, you know, at the time I was a varsity athlete. I was a division one squash player. That's me playing squash on the right. Um, and I was, you know, had a busy um, social life. And I just thought the sleepiness I felt in college was sort of like average college sleepiness. So, uh, I didn't think that much of it. When I graduated from college at age 21, I moved to Boston into this beautiful apartment in the Fenway district, uh, with one of my best friends. We were just a few blocks from Fenway park. And, um, one of the first nights though, that we lived there, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and hearing, someone, um, you know, fiddling with the lock on the window, uh, in our living room. And, um, then I saw my door open and a man rush at me, like he was going to attack me. Um, and, uh, I wanted to kick him or, you know, get up and like get away, but I couldn't move. Um, and I just kind of lay there terrified thinking, oh my God, he's about to strangle me. Um, and I couldn't do anything. Um, I don't know how much time went by, but I looked up again and, and there was no man 
and my door was closed. So I went out in the living room and I saw that the window wasn't broken into. And then I realized that my roommate was still asleep. And I thought that was strange because he'd made a lot of noise. So how could she have slept through that? <laughs> so um, I thought, well, maybe it was just a dream, but it didn't feel like a dream. I had plenty of dreams and something felt different about that. But um, I guess glad there wasn't a burglar. Yay. <laughs> Um, a few weeks after that, about, I'd say, um, I was just getting ready to go for a run along the Charles river, uh, which is in this picture here. This is my usual running route. And, um, I was just standing in the, my living room with my roommate, getting ready to go and stretching and, uh, talking to her and something she said was funny. And, um, as I laughed, I felt like someone had like poked behind my knees almost, um, that like they had almost melted for a split second. And I said to my roommate, I said, you just see that my niece just did something funny. And she said, no, I didn't see anything. So I was like, okay. So I stretched my, uh, my legs a little bit more and I didn't feel it again. So I just went for my run and I kind of forgot about it. Um, but over the next, uh, few months, um, it happened again a few times and I started to realize it was usually when I was laughing. So I would say to my friends, like, don't make me laugh. My knees, my knees, um, and they never really saw anything wrong with my knees, but I would, they would see me sort of like kind of lean for a wall or a desk or something to support myself. Um, cause I had this sensation that I was like, um, kind of going to fall, even though I wasn't actually really falling. Um, so, um, I started law school then, uh, a year later at age 22. Um, and I was really excited to be there. My my dad was a lawyer. He thought it was the greatest honor of his life to be a lawyer. And, um, you know, I was excited to kind of like be, I was the third kid. So I was kind of his last chance at like a lawyer legacy. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I was excited to go to Boston college and, um, and my, I wanted to study art law actually in particular, which was a really cool topic. Uh, so, but the first semester I, um, I continued to go to the bathroom during classes, uh, and I remember trying to read the textbook and reading the same case over a few times and feeling like uh, every time I read the words, I read them, but then at the end, I couldn't remember what I'd read, that something like wasn't sticking in my brain. And that was so frustrating. And I remember thinking like, where did my willpower go? Like, what's wrong with me? Because I want to be there. Um, but the, the dots weren't connecting and I thought it was like something wrong with me. Um, and it felt important. It felt just as important as any other part of my life. And I probably more important, your first year of law school is like the year to shine. You know, you have to like do well then I knew that. And, um, just something didn't feel necessarily right. Um, but you know, this is kind of what you had seen of me. I was playing law school softball and all smiles and, <laughs> Uh, so it really was not something that people saw necessarily. Um, and this is one of the first pictures I have of me, um, you know, kind of sleeping in a public place, I guess. Uh, I went for spring break to visit one of my best friends who was, um, studying graduate school in London for art history. And, um, this picture on the top, we were at a Starbucks around 4 PM and I ended up falling asleep and we, you know, we kind of laughed about it at the time. And my friend now feels bad about the photos, um, that she took <laughs> with me and of me, but, um, you know, we just thought I was probably jet lagged all week in London, I guess, um, which is, I guess, possible. Um, but towards the end of that trip, I went to go see Wicked, um, which I don't know if, you know, you guys have, um, you know, seen Wicked or if you have a favorite thing. For me, I'd listen to the Wicked soundtrack like a hundred times in my car um, before I ever saw it. This is my first time going to see it. So, you know, whatever your thing is, whether it's a Super Bowl or, you know, um, your favorite sport or, you know, kind of like music group or something, this was like the thing for me to see. And so I loved it. Like the first act was amazing. I was like, oh my God, I'm seeing Wicked. Um, and then during intermission, I went and got a beer uh, in the um, lobby and brought it back in and um, was so excited for the second act. But then I actually woke up at the end of the second act and had pretty much missed all of it sleeping. Um, and I was like pretty annoyed because this was kind of different. Like 
when I was getting sleepy and not being able to concentrate reading my law school textbooks, like they are admittedly dense, boring legal cases. Um, this is the thing I wanted to be most awake for, you know, um, and that I wasn't really able to stay awake through that was frustrating. Um, but there was no real consequence. It's not like I, you know, got in a car accident or I endangered anyone else's safety. Like no one cared. Like I just slept through it. Um, I was by myself. So it was just my own disappointment. It really wasn't until the end of my first year of law school that I thought maybe I have like a sleep problem. Um, and that's when I was during exams and, um, during exam week, we didn't have any classes. All we had to do was study. So, um, by now I knew I was a good sleeper. I probably got nine or 10 hours of sleep, um, and woke up in the morning, had a normal breakfast, oatmeal, coffee, got in my car. I lived just 15 minutes from law school, one stop on the highway. Um, and I um, remember getting off the highway and being like, oh, I don't feel very good. Like my vision felt blurry. Um, I thought maybe I should pull over, but then I was just like literally one minute from law school, two minutes maybe. So I thought, just get to law school, just get to law school is like not really a good place to pull over before law school. Um, well, next thing I woke up in the parking lot and um, of, of law school and my car was parked and I was fine, but I didn't remember pulling into this driveway or choosing the parking spot reclining my seat, like turning off my car. Like I didn't have memories of those moments and that really scared me. Um, and that was really the first time I thought like, this isn't normal. Like who can't drive 15 minutes in the morning? Whereas before that, I just made so many excuses. I, I, I could all at once kind of see these excuses. Like I'm not a morning person. I'm not a night person. Um, I haven't had caffeine. I've had too much caffeine. Like I just come up with so many little ways of excusing stuff. And, um, this just felt like, no, I think everyone should be able to do 15 minute drive in the morning, you know, with coffee and nine or 10 hours of sleep. Um, so after exams, I, uh, went to a primary care doctor at Boston college. These are the actual notes from my appointment, um, where, you know, I started, I guess, by saying, I think I have a sleep disorder. Um, I knew of sleep apnea. My brother-in-law had sleep apnea. So, that's just the only thing I knew, the term sleep disorder, I guess. Um, and I said, I'm sleeping all the time. I'm never feeling rested. Um, and the doctor asked me more about my sleepiness. And I'd said that I was having a hard time driving. Um, and I, I remember her saying something to the effect of, well, we all get tired when we drive. Like even she has to pull over for a coffee at times. Um, that was strange because I remember there was like a small voice in me thinking, I don't know that she's talking about the same kind of sleepiness, but I, how would I know? I didn't know how to measure her sleepiness against mine. Um, and then here you can see number two, I said, <laughs> when I'm laughing very hard, her knees are giving out and head is heavy. Um, I really did bring up these two issues as separate issues. I saw them as not having anything to do with each other um, because they didn't in my head. Um, but it is kind of striking to go back and look at these notes and see how I did bring these to her attention right next to each other. Um, and she thought that could be, actually, I mentioned it. I thought it could be neurological because of the, um, the connection with emotion. Uh, it's something my stepmom had thought of and, um, she thought, yeah, maybe it's neurological. I'll let you see a neurologist. You might find out it's just some kind of, uh, random rare thing you're going to have to get used to. And um, that was really hard to hear because it was actually getting worse at this point. Um, and it was starting to affect more emotions. Um, there was one day I was getting ready to cross the street, like walk across, you know, you wait for the walk signal. And then um, as I was about to, I got the walk signal, I'm about to walk across the street. And then a car almost turns right into the lane. You know, it happens to everybody. And you kind of shoot the car a look like, what are you doing? Don't approach. Uh, I had the walk signal. And that like, I guess what you would say annoyance, uh, it's not that big of a deal, but, um, even that I stumbled on the sidewalk, uh, and that kind of worried me as far as like safety and stuff. Like what if I were to fall in the middle of a road? So, um, and then here you can see, I was at this point, 169 and a half pounds. And I, that was kind of striking to me in the appointment. I remembered, um, that I, I knew that my weight in April had been 155. So I'd gained almost 15 pounds in a few months and I really couldn't, um, 
I couldn't exactly explain that. It was completely out of the norm for me entirely. Um, so um, she wanted to check my uh, my iron levels and um, thyroid and stuff like that. Um, and then she said, eventually she could take, I could go for a sleep study. Um, but, um, she also sent me to sports therapist cause I had another issue. I had a runner's knee just cause I was running a lot and I was starting to have pain under my knees, which was different. Didn't have anything to do with my, um, knees buckling with laughter, but, um, I did go to a sports therapist at Boston college and the week later and the sports therapist asked me, do your knees ever buckle? Like when she was asking me like a ton of questions, and I was like, oh, well, there's this thing that happens when I laugh and it has nothing to do with my running. Um, and she said, no, tell me more about it. So I told her more. And it was like, I told her it was with some more emotions, like when I was annoyed. And she said, I think I've heard of that. I think that's called cataplexy. So she wrote that word down for me. Um, and then we went back to talking about like orthotics and x-rays for my runner's knee. Uh, and I went home and I, and I Googled that term, you know, cataplexy and learned it was like this muscle weakness triggered by emotions, often with laughter. And I was like, oh my God. And I tried to Google before. I don't know why I'd never just put the terms in correctly, I guess, to ever find this word myself. Um, so as you guys know, um, you know, uh, I saw the cataplexy was found in people with narcolepsy. And I really thought like narcolepsy, no way, that's not me. Um, that's a joke about someone falling asleep when they're standing or in the middle of a sentence. Um, and it's like, you know, slowly you could just see like my brain slowly making the dots connect where I was like, oh my God, that sleep disorder I thought I had when I learned about excessive daytime sleepiness, I was like, okay, maybe it's being sleepy. It's not necessarily like falling asleep in your soup or while you're standing, but I certainly thought I had a sleep disorder at this point. Um, then the cataplexy, uh, and then when I read about hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis, um, that burglar who had visited me, it was just one of many strange visitors that I'd been having, um, you know, thinking that my roommate had come home, but she wasn't talking to me and trying to yell out to her, but not really being able to, um, thinking there was a cat scratching me in my apartment and then real like waking up and like still being able to feel this cat's scratches, but then realizing like, we don't have a cat. Um, so I just never thought of those as medical problems. So I'd never really brought those to anyone's attention, except for my brother. I'd, I'd mentioned that to my brother and he said that that had happened to him in college and it would go away. So I was still waiting for those to go away. They hadn't, um, and, uh, disrupted nighttime sleep. Obviously that's actually back in 2007, when I was diagnosed. That's really, wasn't really talked about, um, like it is now. Um, I don't, I, I thought I was a great sleeper. Um, I thought I could sleep anytime. Um, and, uh, so I didn't necessarily think there was a problem with my nighttime sleep, but, um, you know, I was lucky to have a friend in law school who, um, as soon as I knew the term and I said to my friends, I think I might have narcolepsy. Um, I actually had two friends who had connections to a great, uh, neurologist at Harvard, just down the street from me, um, at Beth Israel. And, um, so I was able to get in for a sleep study, uh, at the beginning of my second year of law school. And, uh, I was formally diagnosed, you know, with type one narcolepsy with cataplexy at age 24. Um, and, uh, I remember, uh, the doctor was so excited by the results of my sleep study. I'm one of those classic cases where, um, you know, I went into REM sleep so quickly in all of my naps that it was just so amazing. <laughs> Um, and I remember thinking, this is not so amazing. I want to be a great law student, not like a great neurological patient, but at the same time, it was super validating because something real was happening. Um, and, uh, at least in that little doctor's office, uh, it was, it was a real thing. Unlike, um, I'd say the rest of the world, which often still thinks of this condition as a joke, um, so uh, we started talking about treatments uh, at this point when I was diagnosed. I'd actually started a stimulant over the summer because he was worried about my driving. Um, but this is when we started talking about nighttime medications and he wanted me to try sodium oxybate twice a night. And um, uh, I was kind of like startled by all the rules around this. I thought I was going to take a medication and just like it would just be very easy. I had never had a chronic illness or knew anyone that did before. So, um, when he said like that, I wouldn't be able to drink alcohol and I'd have to wake up in the middle of the night and I was to take a second dose of it. And I thought, 
oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, but I have to back up a few days to my 24th birthday. It was just four days before I was diagnosed. Um, and here's pictures from that night. It was um, the law school boat cruise. So, um, and, and my birthday. So um, I was kind of the queen of the cruise, you'd say. Uh, my friends got me this beautiful tiara. I've never seen such a huge birthday tiara ever again. Um, I don't know where they got this, but um, you know, I really hammed it up. We were wearing water wings in case we fell into the Boston Harbor on the cruise. Uh, and we just had this really great night. Um, and uh, people were buying me drinks because it was my birthday. Um, I had started to notice that after drinking that weakness or that cataplexy was worse, but um, I didn't think that much of it um, until the next morning I woke up um, and uh, was just walking to the bathroom and thought of something funny. And um, I uh, had to lean against the wall next to me in, in the hallway of my apartment and I kind of just slithered down to the ground um, and I wanted to like call out to my roommate to help me, but my jaw wasn't really working and um it was uh just kind of terrifying I remember thinking in my head like move a muscle like move your finger move your toe like get up Julie um but I couldn't and um uh every like I'd say second that I was on the ground was extremely long feeling uh I wanted to breathe deeper like that's a big sensation for me um, like, and my, I was breathing, but I just couldn't control my breath or, or choose to breathe deeper, uh, as a strange sensation. And, um, and then I'd say it was just maybe about a minute, but this was my longest, uh, cataple cataplexy episode that I'd had so far. Um, and so once I, you know, got up and I went to the bathroom and, um, uh, I, it came back again quickly and that was new too. Like usually I felt this once, um, but once it was kind of like a once a day thing if I had felt it, but this was like, it was happening. I could feel it again quickly. And so um, that day I ended up not really being able to do anything. I just laid on the couch. I was kind of like in and out of sleep. And um, and uh, my boyfriend at the time, he came over and, and brought food over and we just watched movies. And then that night he actually like carried me in his arms to bed. Um. And that was a Saturday. And I remember thinking I have like job interviews on Monday for like dream jobs. Like, how am I going to, what if I can't walk? Right. Um, so then if you fast forward to Tuesday, when I was actually diagnosed with narcolepsy with cataplexy and, and the doctor was talking about taking this medication and all these lifestyle adjustments I'd have to make. I honestly remember in my head thinking, um, I probably need to walk more than I need to drink alcohol. So I guess I'll choose walking. Um, and I'll try this medication. That's how my 24 year old head worked. So um, I tried the um, medication he recommended. Um, and uh, it took, I'd say a few months. This is my actual law school library <laughs> where I often studied at one of these tables. And uh, after a few months of taking the medication, I remember it was about 9 PM and I was studying at one of these tables and all at once it hit me that I hadn't slept yet that day and that my brain was still working and that there was like no heaviness on my skull. Um, and I all at once started crying, um, because I had lost touch with that feeling of feeling nothing in my head, <laughs> which is a strange way of putting it, but that's the truth. Like I didn't know anymore what it felt like not to feel a heaviness on my skull. And I realized it had gotten so bad. That's that heaviness, that sleepiness over so many years. Um, that it was way worse than I'd ever even realized. Um, and so, and, and what a relief to not have to feel that all the time. So um, adjusting the medications was not easy. Uh, I'd say I had a lot of side effects with stomach issues and nausea um, and trying to take the second dose in the middle of the night and then still wake up and, you know, get to law school on time. And um, uh, I was still taking naps most days, even though that one day I just described, I didn't have to. And that was really, really amazing. Um, I still, in, I, I had a cubicle in, in the basement of the law school um, where I could kind of like hide away and take naps. I often had a lot of hallucinations there of people walking by and uh, strange stuff like that. But, um, you know, it was, it was both, you know, I was improving my symptoms and the cataplexy went away very quickly with the medications. Um, 
Uh, so, and the sleepiness was getting better too. So I was seeing a lot of benefits as, as well as the, having side effects. Um, so, you know, if you'd seen me on Instagram, even though there was no Instagram at this time back in 2008, thank God. Um, but this was kind of like what you would have seen in my life. Um, I was still playing law school, uh, the Red Sox were in the playoffs. So, um, it, it probably looked like everything on the outside was just fine. Um, but it was, um, it was a lot more to manage, uh, than on internally, uh, I guess you'd say, or, or behind closed doors or what I was doing at night and, um, you know, hiding in the law school basement, uh, and, you know, feeling sick to my stomach, uh, all that was kind of hidden away. Um, and I thought I could kind of like live these two lives almost. It started to feel like this life with narcolepsy and managing it. And then my law school life. Um, so yeah, uh, it didn't quite go as easily as I thought to go take medications and go back to my life as planned. Um, the other thing is, is that I felt like my law school friends, I love them a lot, but, um, when I started to talk about narcolepsy, uh, that like it somehow created a divide between us that hadn't been there before. And I'm thinking, I'm the same Julia as before. I'm still your friend. Like, I don't get it. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so it just kind of was a hard it was a strange topic to talk about, but I started to realize I also like needed to talk about it, um, that I wasn't going to be able to just like keep it to myself. Um, so the first person who really, I'd say got it and understood was my dad. Um, my dad and my stepmom uh, and I went to a narcolepsy network conference in Albany, New York, um, just about, I'd say six months after I was diagnosed, they had this mini conference and I just wanted to read a quick passage from my book about that experience. Um, on Sunday morning, dad came into my hotel room to talk over the logistics of the conference and the drive home. He turned to leave and then he stopped at the door and, whack, and, and walked back towards me. Had he forgotten something? I'm so proud of you, Jules. He opened his arms to hug me, which was strange. He wasn't much of a hugger. He'd always been sort of an awkward dad, not the touchy feely type. He, he hugged me tightly and then his body began to shake and I realized he was crying, weeping really. He convulsed in my arms. I'd never seen him cry, never mind felt him cry. It made me so sad I didn't want to hug anymore. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, he repeated between sobs. It's okay, Dad. He finally let me go and sat on the edge of my bed, rocking back and forth and clasping his hands tightly. It was a place he'd seen me many times. He'd listened patiently to my hopeless sobs, most recently with the breakup. I sat next to him on the bed, unsure what to say or do. I didn't understand before, but I get it now. He finally said, it's much worse than I realized. Funny, I thought he understood my narcolepsy better than anyone else, but now he thought he got it. It's not your fault, I said, but it's not fair, you're so young. It's gonna be okay, daddy. This is a white lie and we both knew it, but what else could I say? Eventually he calmed down and left. I looked around the bare hotel room and finished folding my clothes into my suitcase in silence. The conference had a big effect on dad, perhaps bigger than it had on me. Now he held his own burden to love someone deeply, his youngest child, his fabulous jewels, and watch her navigate a serious illness. He'd always been my knight in shining armor, helping me through all my lowest points, but he couldn't save me from narcolepsy. Um, so it was really hard to see him upset. Um, I don't know what it is <laughs> about families, but, you know, uh, maybe in your own experience, sometimes like you tell your family something, but like then them hearing it from other people, like going to the conference and then meeting other people with narcolepsy, somehow that really resonated. Um, and it, it and, and so like, obviously I didn't want to see my dad upset, but I needed, I needed someone's support and he really was that. Um, so really grateful for that. Um, because I couldn't like kind of do this alone. Um, so there was kind of a, a mistake I'd say that changed my life uh, and something that I'm a huge advocate for now, which is that um, when I went to that primary care doctor and, and she kind of suggested it could be uh, average sleepiness or, you know, anemia or uh, a thyroid issue. She'd also mentioned depression. And um, I didn't necessarily feel depressed, but I did feel out of control. Like I was starting to feel like my life was spiraling out of control for some reason. And I was willing to do anything like, you know, I didn't want to resist like going to a therapist or, or considering depression, 
because, you know, um, if I didn't know what was wrong, like I had to pursue everything. Right. So I went to a therapist and I saw that therapist once before I found the word cataplexy, which led to narcolepsy. And I, and I meant to actually like kind of cancel the next appointment. Cause I, um, but I forgot to, so I was like, all right, I'll just go to the appointment. So I went to the appointment and I just told her what had happened, you know, oh, well, I don't think it's really depression. I think I figured it out. It's, um, you know, narcolepsy and, uh, and I just found, I liked talking to her. And so I just kept going to this therapist and I went to her for the next two years. Uh, and she was hugely instrumental in me adjusting to narcolepsy in law school. Um, she was the first person that I could say out loud to that I wanted to write a book. Um, cause I was scared to tell my dad that, uh, cause I knew already, you know, family, you just know, um, uh, what is going to be like acceptable and not. Um, and, uh, so I, uh, I just think it's interesting now. Cause I think my doctor would have said that I would have been someone who had, uh, the skills and resources to adjust well to narcolepsy. And I'm sure that my doctor would still say, I probably did a great job of that, but I'd say that, um, having a therapist was, was a huge part of that over those next two years for me in adjusting. The only reason I stopped going to her is because I moved to Washington DC. Otherwise I'm sure she still would have been my therapist. Um, so this just kind of brings up, I think the social side. And I think this is really underrated in how we, um, think about narcolepsy. Um, and so there has been over, I'd say almost 40 years now of incredible research um, showing that narcolepsy impacts health-related um, quality of life outcomes. Um, so there's tons and tons of research, you know, I mean, like tons, right? Um, but there's actually only been one paper about health-related stigma, and this was a study done in 2015. Um, and so I just wanted to bring up this concept to you of health-related stigma, a social process characterized by exclusion, rejection, blame, or devaluation that re results from experience, perception, or reasonable anticipation of an adverse social judgment about a person or a group. So um, this is the feeling that every single time in my life <laughs> that I bring up to someone that I have narcolepsy, that my, my stomach is in a knot thinking, what are they about? How are they going to react? Um, so the best analogy I can think of is imagine something as serious to you as maybe being a doctor, uh, imagine bringing that up, but, but knowing that that would come with someone just laughing at you and, and thinking that's so weird. Why would you laugh at me? I should be so proud of being a doctor. Like, and that's now how I feel is that's so weird. Why would you laugh at me for having narcolepsy? I am so proud of everything I overcome every day. Um, so, you know, I think Sigma and the social aspects of narcolepsy are really underrated. And interestingly, I think, um, they've shown that, um, that stigma can be a predictor for low health related quality of life. Um, and so this study really looked at, uh, young adults with narcolepsy and they reported significant stigma in all domains, um, as compared to people without narcolepsy, um, in social rejection, financial insecurity, internalized shame and social isolation. Um, and then these were also comparable, these very, um, significant levels of stigma were also very comparable to people living with epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and actually really, if you look at the data, uh, most closely with people with HIV. Um, so I think, you know, the levels of stigma are very, very, um, significant. Um, and why I want to bring this up is because I think often with the health related quality of life studies, people are saying narcolepsy impacts people, it impacts their quality of life so much. And then maybe there's this thinking that if the treatments just get better for narcolepsy, these health related quality of life issues will go away. Um, but um, my thinking is that if the stigma is actually one of the drivers for this health related quality of life, that that's not actually true. And we need to also um, address the uh, the social issues, the stigma of narcolepsy um, at both an individual level and a societal level, um, you know, helping people feel more empowered themselves, but also at a societal level so that people don't hear the word narcolepsy and then just start laughing. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but that's some of what we've been trying to do. So I try to advocate for prescribing social support, um, that, you know, and that like, honestly, feeling lost and alone, if that was listed as a symptom of narcolepsy, maybe we would think of it more seriously in how you um, approach treating that loneliness and that um, stigma. So um, the thing I try to say is a wonderful first step is connecting with the patient organizations. Um, these are some of the major ones in the US that are fantastic. Uh, and there's 32 different organizations around the world as well. Um, 
And it's just a great, it's a great first step for people to find their community. Um, so, and we talk about treatment as four pillars, um, medication, naps, coping strategies, like, uh, fitness and diet and, um, like, uh, sleep hygiene type stuff and also social support. Um, so for me, uh, my dad had, was a, was an employment lawyer. So, uh, he told me not to say on the internet that I had narcolepsy because people would discriminate against me. Um, and I followed his advice for law school. And then after I graduated, uh, I'd studied, I ended up studying health law and health policy. And, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't not speak up anymore. I felt like we were kind of caught in this catch 22 of misperceptions of narcolepsy, which drove people to stay silent. Um, but how do you break this cycle? Um, if you just continue to stay silent and let those misperceptions perpetuate. So, um, to break that cycle, like people just had to speak up and I wanted to just be one of those people, I guess. Um, I had studied creative nonfiction, so I decided to start working on a book. I moved to Washington, DC and started advocating, just showing up at any public meeting. Um, I think this was an SRS Hill day. Uh, they had a congressional briefing. I think it was my first time on the Hill. And I remember listening to Phyllis Z speak and just kind of being in awe of some of the work that was being done on the Hill to promote sleep research. And um, yeah, so it was just the early days of getting involved. Uh, and then eventually I founded Project Sleep. Um, and so we're, you know, a 501c3 nonprofit and we have a ton of programs now. And so it's been quite a journey over the past 10 years, maybe a different book someday about the journey of uh, becoming more of a um, advocate. Um, we have put together our expert advisory board uh, and really proud because I think this, as far as I know, is one of the first expert advisory boards of a nonprofit to include patient voices. So we have both clinicians, researchers, and patient advocates on the board. Um, they're not separate. We put them all at the same table and let them interact. Um, so really proud of that. Um, Rising Voices is one of our um, major programs to help reduce that stigma um, by training patient advocates on how to share their story, um, kind of like I've done today. Uh, and everyone has a great story, but often it's overwhelming to figure out how to make a presentation. So we work individually with these um, advocates to prepare them to give presentations. Um, and we've trained people with um, narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnia, sleep apnea, um, and REM sleep behavior disorder so far. And we're hoping to continue to uh, support people with different sleep disorders to become speakers. Uh, so we have over 150 now trained speakers in 18 countries around the world. So that's some of that uh, shift that we wanna see to have more grassroots uh, advocates out there sharing their story. Cause when you put a real face to a medical condition, it um, helps people to realize it's not just a joke in a movie, that it's um, something that could happen to you, your family, um, your coworker, et cetera. So our sleep advocacy program um, is something else I'm really proud of. Obviously having studied health policy, um, we are working really hard to, um, do what we can on a, you know, kind of like a systematic level. So right now, a lot of our advocacy is actually focused around the CDC. Um, currently, the CDC has no um, sleep health, sleep disorders education uh, hub, the same way that I served on the national, uh, at NIH, I served on that national sleep disorders research advisory board. Like that's because there was a bill back in, I think it was the nineties or something that established that, you know, NIH needed a home for sleep. Um, there is no home for sleep at um, CDC. There's no funding um, for sleep awareness and professional education. Um, so that's what we're working on really hard right now. We have a bill that we're working on um, to have the CDC establish uh, basically um, a, you know, a program and a home for sleep. So we think that'll be really cool. That's something that is like, for me, a dream. Um, after that, I can retire. Although I think I'm too young. So I guess I have to keep going. But um, that's like the thing, that's like one of the main things I've most wanted to um, do with my career. So I'm really excited to actually even just be working on that and working on the bill. Um, so uh, we have other resources. We do this narcolepsy nerd alert. Um, so we dive into different topics about living with narcolepsy from school accommodations, work accommodations, the science of narcolepsy, um, yeah, brain fog, pregnancy, just lots of different uh, topics that um, are, you know, um, 
just more daily living, I guess. Um, we have a program that we're working on educating journalists about sleep disorders. Uh, I think there's this really strange divide where articles often um, online, uh, we surveyed them actually. Um, and if you looked at like the last 10 major articles about sleep, you know, I mean, in like Forbes and uh, Newsweek or something, they'll talk about sleep health as if sleep disorders don't exist. <laughs> um, and they'll say like, oh, you need to get better sleep. Here are your tips. Here's the bedroom. Here's your, you know, whatever your, your gummies or <laughs> whatever. Uh, and they act as if people with undiagnosed sleep disorders are not also reading those articles and uh, possibly looking for information there as well. Um, and we think that's a big problem because people with undiagnosed sleep disorders are looking to the same information as just average people that maybe don't have a sleep disorder. So I think it's important to mention that sleep disorders exist. That's why sleep health and sleep disorders cannot be, in my opinion, separate campaigns. Um, they need to be linked. Um, and so we've created a, um, a toolkit for journalists to help them feel more empowered to include um, information about, you know, basic information about sleep disorders and also patient stories. Um, we did an event in New York City and leading up to National Sleep uh, Week this year, we'll be doing a lot to um, get the word out to more journalists. We'll do an online event for them and um, publish this toolkit online. Um, even part of this toolkit is what images to use and not use um, to make sure that they're not perpetuating misperceptions about um, loss of illnesses, like for instance, sleep apnea, um, that, uh, a lot of the images around sleep apnea are older white men. And, you know, we know that, um, like many different people can have sleep apnea and, um, that that kind of a stereotype can, um, lead to a delay in diagnosis for someone like a young woman, um, who also has sleep apnea. So, uh, that's some of the work we're doing there. <clears throat> Um, so like, you know, for my life today, I, you know, I've been diagnosed 16 years. So, uh, it is both a part of every day, but also, um, you know, really proud of all that I have accomplished. So I like to say I can do anything, but I can't do everything, which is probably true for anyone. But I think, especially living with narcolepsy, I just have to be very careful with my time. So, um, I, I, you know, I was really lucky to give the TEDx talk. Um, I ran a marathon in St. George. That was my fourth marathon actually, um, last year, I killed my knees and I'll probably never do again. So that's just me getting old. Um, those knees of mine are still an issue. Um, but, uh, you know, so I've had some really great adventures. Um, you know, this was actually this fall, but I, I love this, um, example of how my life is so many different pictures, even in one week. Uh, you know, here's me driving on route five, uh, down to the clinical trial site where I was participating in a clinical trial, um, there's my dog. They actually let me bring my dog to the clinical trial site. Um, we're not sure that that was allowed, but, uh, it was really, really nice of them. It helped me out with my, with my dog care during the clinical trial. Um, and so here I was, you know, participating in research. And then if you'd seen that, so that, I think that was on a Tuesday. If you see me on Friday, here I am after Pilates, you know, looking strong and healthy. And you wouldn't know that two days ago, I was part of a clinical trial and, um, here's me actually napping in my car on the way down to uh, San Diego to uh, give a presentation down there. Um, so, you know, it's uh, both parts of my world are, are, I mean, it's, there's just a lot of different sides of my life, I guess. So I just really like to encourage people um, to prescribe social support and patient organizations like medication. That was um why, you know, it was talking about stigma so much and the importance of, of the social side and addressing that. Not necessarily that your doctor has to be your therapist, but maybe you can also have a therapist or you can have a friend with narcolepsy. Uh, it can be just life-changing. Um, and thank you guys for inviting me to speak. And we have these great Rising Voices speakers. If you'd ever like to um, have one of them present to you, um, we're always really grateful for any opportunities. Um, so, you know, I just like to always end my presentations by sharing that, you know, you've heard my story and, um, so grateful for that. Um, but of course, um, you know, I'm just one of many, many people, many stories. So here are some of my friends around the world. This is Adam in Australia. This is Mo in Dubai, Rayanne in the UK. This is Debbie in, uh, Maryland. This is Nancy and Deb Debbie in um, Iowa. They're two friends that have narcolepsy. This is Cyan in South Korea. This is Katie in Australia. 
This is Barrymont and Eric in Virginia and um, uh, Connor and Colin in Mississippi. This is um, Nancy in, uh, I think it's Kansas. This is Nils Emil, Nils Emil in Sweden and Kenya in North Carolina. This is Kevin in Virginia, Chloe in Scotland, Alexander and his family in Ireland. And this is Katie, she's an American, but at the time she was a journalist uh, in South Africa. Uh, Colin in Ohio. Uh, this is a support group I've attended here in Los Angeles. Uh, and support support <clears throat> support groups and conferences around the world in uh, the UK, Australia, Spain, Sweden, Canada, Italy, and Japan. So um, yeah, just on behalf of the one in every 2,000 people diagnosed, thank you for listening to my story. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Julie, that that was great. You know, thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, and thank you for for sharing your your personal journey and your your passion for sleep. And and thank you as well for for what you do for the for the community. Uh, 